On today's Wall Street Wildlife, why America is dead and how it could affect you, we go on stock safari with Nintendo and a private company that's in the military technology space. And we revisit the king of the jungle portfolio with just three weeks to go left in the competition and ask the question, can Christoph catch up? Damn Toot and I could catch up, but that's for later. More, <laughs> more, more importantly is we have three more patrons joining our jungle. So okay. shout out to Bruce B, Deborah F, and Sam G with an especially mighty big uh, furry scratch to Bruce B, who is our first team monkey Ooh. tier. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> so we have one monkey and zero badgers in the jungle. Bruce, you are a mensch. Good on you, mate. <laughs> I will try to make you proud next year. <laughs> Did Bruce, um, have a, did Bruce have a particular request for Team Monkey? You got to perform for us, King of the Jungle? Yeah, I think he knows what's up. I think he knows where the future gains lie. And he's just, you know, sending the old monkey a little encouragement and what has been a somewhat unfortunate start to the contest. But more <laughs> more about that later. The, the... You know what we should, we could do? We, we, we talked in the past about we've got our Patreons. We want to do something for our Patreons, but we're like, it's too early to do like a whole bunch of bonus content because we're so focused on building the, like the actual channel. Uh, but I was in Austin because I just, just said King of the Jungle. I was in Austin. I sang and you danced at that karaoke joint, uh, the jungle book, uh, King of the Swingers. So why don't we repackage that video and we'll send that to all of our paying Patreons. Oh, Amy, that's so great. Right. That'll be a Patreon only exclusive. <laughs> that's, that's genius. Right. So if you all uh, haven't caught up to our show, we are at patreon.com slash Wall Street Wildlife, where if you want to belong to our tribe and get some cool perks, that's where t- you can cast your vote. And I promise I won't be posting any poop to you in boxes if you caught last week's episode. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Badger. So, is America broke? Actually, uh, before we do that, you might notice I'm wearing a different T-shirt today, and I did want to riff about that. Does this does this imagery look at all familiar to you? Do you know who Coffeezilla is? Uh, I do not, but that looks like a almost like a Miyazaki, like a play on Miyazaki, like what's it called, uh, Totoro, standing in the rain. He is the online investigative journalist, mostly on YouTube, who went deep with the FTX scandal, managed to get an interview with Bankman Freed. Uh, he exposed what he saw as a load of fraud around the Rabbit R1, like a bunch of other crypto scams. He does good work, he just digs deep and sometimes feels the pain of it because he's on the receiving end of threats and lawsuits. And the current litigation is from... I don't know, internet celebrity, I don't know how you describe him, Logan Paul. CoffeeZilla is defending what looks like a bit of a frivolous lawsuit. It turns out Texas doesn't have anti-slap laws. So this isn't a case that might be heard in other jurisdictions. And it's all about a cryptocurrency NFT offering that Logan Paul offered a couple of years ago. And CoffeeZilla alleges it's gammy. So CoffeeZilla, unfortunately, his legal insurance is not valid and isn't protecting them against what could be a fairly nasty set of legal fees running well into the six figures. So he was selling t-shirts and merch, of which I am now the proud owner of one. But you can also find him on his Patreon and give him some love if you like his content and you want him to carry on doing the good work he does. So I'm, I'm, this is interesting, Badger, because you are a guy who in our context, stays pretty far clear away from crypto. I'm the sort of guy that has a very significant position in both Chainlink and Bitcoin. But I always thought this was, yes, a space that you're not that interested in. So it's a little surprising that you have such a genuine, uh, that you're putting your back into supporting this guy. Is it like on the premise that he's a good journalist and, and you want to support journalists or? Yeah, exactly. I think he does really good work, not just anti-crypto scams. He, one of the first sets of YouTube uh, things he published was around Madoff's Ponzi scheme and a whole bunch of other stuff, basically trying to bring awareness with a bit of entertainment to kind of the bad things that can happen 
online and how you should be a bit more cautious and kind of protect yourself. But yeah, he's managed to get some interviews with some notorious names. So I quite like his shtick. Okay, right on. Speaking of, there's a new HBO documentary scheduled to release, I believe, this week about allegedly some deep dive journalists undercovering who Satoshi is, the founder of Bitcoin. Mm. My guess it is they, they don't find anything, you know, that it's a, it's a lot of uh, hoopla. But I think the story itself is quite interesting. And certainly the Bitcoin world and all of that, you know, there's so much speculation because it is a, quite a mystery. So HBO Max, the story of Bitcoin's founder. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll check it out. Very good. Even though I'm not a crypto guy. Well, you wanted to talk about America. Should we uh, hit that segment? <laughs> yeah, America seems to have a lot going on uh, in the coming week. So tell us why America's broke. Yeah, America's broke and it could affect you, my friend, plus all of our American listeners. I think it's quite interesting to think about a country like it's a business. And there's a really nice Twitter account called appeconomyinsights.com. Uh, and they they just do these really nice, like, I don't what do you call them? Like, not waterfall diagrams, but, you know, you see, like, money coming in, money going out, and how it all gets spent. And then over there, I just, it caught my eye over the weekend. They did a nice article as a freebie on treating the US as a business and looking at inflows and outflows and understanding whether the US is solvent. So like any company, the country and like the CEO of the country is currently Joe Biden, the country has a budget and money comes in, that's like your revenue, so taxes and money gets spent and that the, the government publishes a budget and has to get it agreed and like right now, I'll pop this up on screen. There's a breakdown of last year's full year 2023 net costs, like all the money out. So it's about $7.9 trillion net costs last year. And 22% of that is health and human services. So that's basically like Medicare and all of your very, very expensive uh, healthcare schemes. About 18% is the Department of Veterans Affairs, Social Security, it's about 18%, Defense, 13%, and I thought quite interesting, interest is about 9%. The US government owes so much money, now nearly 10% of its spend every year is just servicing the interest load. Mm -hmm. How does that make you feel as a uh, tax-paying Texan? Not great, Badger, not great. In fact, this is this is one of the reasons that I sold out of the majority of my positions last year, because we're about a year since I made that drastic decision. And I have more to say about this, but I want to let you run if there's more data you want to throw at us. There's a ton of data, and I can, I'll pop some stuff up on screen so we can look at it with our YouTube viewers. Do catch us on YouTube if you want to see like my funky t-shirt. Um, but yeah, like the, I think this my main reason I brought this topic to the podcast today was just this horribly mounting national debt. Um, and the government is essentially having to borrow more money just to service the interest. So maybe like we we'll turn a corner a little bit as interest rates are now coming down. And actually something Trump tried to do during his term 2016 to 2020 was uh, like refinance the debt. That would have actually worked out pretty well if you could stick like this huge debt the US has on a hundred or a thousand year loan at the rates then, which was super low, but the government didn't do that. It didn't get it through. And so, yeah, it's costing you a ton of money. When I'm looking at this graph of US government national debt, you know what I see? The French Alps. <laughs> yeah. And it's actually, it's shocking because the spike, the, 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 the spike over the last, I guess it would be 10 years, mm -hmm. especially the last five, is really worrying and that's not going to slow down this is the connection that i make to uh i don't want to say crypto because most of crypto is scammy but the legitimate crypto use case i think ties in with these principles that if you have a hard currency you can't go fighting wars you can't afford and that's why it's kind of a philosophical position for many people because these kinds of debts don't come out of nowhere i mean we're you know if it's a war and you, you, there's profit to be made, but it comes at such staggering cost and 
today is actually a really sad day. It, uh, you know, the commemoration of October 7th attacks. Right. So the world is seemingly precipitating its war activities. And at some point, you know, like, like you and I do all the time, when you look at the balance sheet and the budget and your, your budget is so far gone, so far in debt, it is unsustainable. So more and more people are, are absolutely, I think rightly terrified of what happens not only under this massive burned debt, but the fact that it's still accelerating. Yeah, like if this was actually a company that we were analyzing as a potential investment, like, as you said, the balance sheet, right? The country has about $4 trillion coming in, in revenues generated, but it has a debt of $36 trillion as of like last month. Like there's no way you would invest in anything that looked remotely like that, right? It's so far underwater. Yeah, it's uninvestable. And it's, you know, people use the term debt spiral because of one of the aspects you mentioned, the interest rates go, go higher. So it only increases the rate at which the debt will rise. So I don't, I really, you know, these are one of those situations, I think no one person understands the answer if there is any. But with the commitment we have in the war in Ukraine, with the expanding crisis in the Middle East, I don't know how we find our way out of this, other than it has something to do with the fact that the U.S. is the world's reserve currency. So we're lucky in the fact that, you know, we control the spigot, so to speak. So other countries would be in bad shape if something happened to the dollar. But that's also why, for example, China is buying massive amounts of gold. And, you know, there's this like the world seems to be splitting into two factions. You know, the world's leaders are looking at this and seeing the trouble the U.S. is in. So it doesn't look good from from the perspective that you brought to our table. As a company, the U.S. looks absolutely dysfunctional. Yeah. Well, it's definitely like at, at least top two priorities for the next administration, whoever they might be. Yeah. And that's why this election is so, I wanted to say cataclysmic, but so... There's so much at stake in all the ways, like the future of the country seems seems dependent on, you know, the the direction we take in accordance with the stuff, and I, I'm I'm worried. Yeah, like we, we, I don't want to get partisan with it. Um, it's actually quite hard to say objectively which party would do a better job of sorting out the economy. It's certainly not clear cut. No, because everything I read from economists say that. Trump's approach to tariffs is actually economically wrong. And I couldn't explain to you exactly why that is at this point. But I also know that Democrats, you know, are the party of higher taxes and greater social spending. And that's certainly not how you reduce a budget. Here's an interesting one little sentence from the article you pulled up. As of September 2024, the national debt stands at a colossal $36 trillion. That's like every single person in America owing over $100,000 to someone else. Yeah. Absolutely staggering and dangerous and not good. So America be broke. America be broke. And I suppose we titled this segment, Here's How It Could Affect You. If the next administration does the smart thing, they're going to have to start raising taxes, cutting spending, we had a whole round of this in the UK like a decade or two ago, which was branded austerity, essentially, you know, tightening the purse strings and trying to be a bit more precise with the limited spend that we have. I don't know that politically the US can get into that kind of place, as you say, particularly having its arms and legs involved in a couple of wars right now. But, you know, the flip side to that is this is precisely just to, I guess, spell this out. This is precisely the reasoning I was using when I sold out of my positions mm -hmm. last year around this time. Right. Because that's when we started our contest. And what did the market do as soon as I sold? I sold pretty much at the very bottom <laughs> <laughs> and the market did nothing but go up. And so all investors need to, you know, it, it's sort of like uh, we're living in Greek tragedies where so many of the gods control the thunderbolts and it's not up to us. You know, the market can remain irrational for however long, but I'm saying I am even more concerned now than I was a year ago. And will the market, you know, especially that the market is now 
that much more expensive. So if I were a new investor at this point, I would be cautious as usual, understand the groundwork and, you know, do not dismiss things like valuation and just expect some, you know, expect things to break and then take a, be able to take advantage of them when they do. But yeah. this is not a time for complacency, I don't think. I totally agree. Market's still ripping though, Christoph, despite everything we said. <laughs> there seems to be no end in sight. Uh, unfortunately, you know, for you and I, well, fortunately and unfortunately, there's two sides to this kind of thing. We know that the exuberance can continue beyond what's rational. And we also know what it feels like and looks like when things flip, which is where seasoned investors can really make, you know, uh, if they remain, if they position themselves to take advantage of that, you could also succeed on the other way, especially continuing to stay grounded and not flip out and not, you know, sell when everyone's selling. Because we've been through this several times, we know that in the long term, the right thing is to stay invested, right? It's not about timing. It's not about the thing, like, it's not about getting cute. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously you say that having not done that, but you have, what you say is absolutely correct. Yeah. Well, actually, asterisk. Because I, I see you, I see you've commented on, uh, on this before. I stayed invested. I just changed what I was invested in. Okay. So that was, you know, that's a subtle point. But I went from high valuations to low valuations, and so far, you know, it it backfired. Sure. But I didn't just sell out, right? That's uh. Is this a good tee up to talk about the king of the jungle? Since we're uh, we're looking at portfolio performance and. My stock's ripping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it is. So the bad news is for all those, all our listeners on Team Monkey, is that my one big bet, which is Coherence Biosciences, has not had the inflection point that I was expecting. They and, have got an earnings or something at the end of the month, right? That's why we gave you an extra couple of days. Uh, it's not going to be till November. Ah, okay. But because of the manufacturing setback, I'm not expecting the market to re-rate the stock. Okay. On the other hand, my second main holding is up 150% for the year, EOS. Great. And there is a tiny, tiny possibility that because of the election cycle, there's rumor word on the street that the Democrats would like to close the DOE loan. In fact, I don't know if you know this, Badger, but Kamala Harris mentioned EOS in one of her speeches not too long ago because it's in Pennsylvania. So, you know, all the thing, all the rah-rah about increasing jobs and industrial workers and all that. So there's a possibility that the DOE loan closes finally after a long, long journey, which means that EOS would then be set up to start producing lines two, three, four, and ad infinitum, and then it'll be all about the orders. There's a very high short uh, percentage of to the stock, short float. So we are kind of set up for a short squeeze worth it, you know, the dominoes to fall the right way. I don't think it's a high probability event, but as of now, in the king of the jungle portfolio, I own 230 shares of EOS. So were it to go up two bucks, which is short squeezy, that would be, that would put me uh, neck and neck with you. Do you want to, is it worth... Uh... Just going down the rabbit hole a tiny bit and explaining what a short squeeze is and why this is a potential candidate. Yes. So in the market, there's always a buyer and seller, and you can take a position as a short where you are expecting the shares to go down. To do that, you borrow those shares at some, usually at some interest rate. If you're right and the shares go down, you make the difference from where you, you, sold them technically when you borrow you're selling them first and then you're buying them back cheaper later and if it does go down you just buy them back at that lower price and pocket the difference the catch is that imagine as a short seller 
some piece of good news hits the wire. In this case, let's say EOS closes the DOE loan. So all of a sudden, if you're a short seller thinking the company is doomed and you get a piece of good news, you're going to buy back those shares, right? That adds buying pressure. So the price is now, there are more buyers. So the price is now going up. So all these other people that have to buy back the shares, they start buying more. So the price now keeps, there's just all these basically influx of additional buyers creating an unnatural pressure, short squeeze, where the more people buy, the higher the price goes, the more important it is for more people to buy. And some of these things historically get absolutely nutty. They're rare. Uh, it doesn't happen every day, but the larger that base of short sellers is to begin with, the higher the p possible explosion is. When you mix that with a low short, you know, float and a high, yeah, high short float. And let, let me just explain that as well, because yeah. on a typical day, like there's only so many shares traded. And so if there's more demand, say that there could be, like, I think the metric is days to cover. There mm -hmm. could be like 10 or more days worth of normal volume so that all the shorts can cover their positions and you know buy back the stock so they don't get totally rinsed because they're stuck on the sidelines trying to buy and failing. And so that's where you get this kind of magnifying effect. Right. And days to cover, by the way, means, you know, uh, on average volume of trading based on how many shares are borrowed, this is how many days it would take on the average volume to buy back all those shares. So the longer, the higher the number, the larger the base of shares that need to be bought back. So if you were, uh, if you were in the queue to try and buy Oasis tickets, like I was for like six hours last month, right? That was you know, a massive imbalance between supply and demand and a ton of people like not cover their positions, but like get a damn seat for the thing. And I do see this now in the papers because I, I sadly failed on every occasion where I thought I got to the top of the queue. There's a whole bunch of buyer's remorse from people who did succeed in buying because they ended up paying way more than they expected to for their Oasis tickets. And I suppose we've got a bunch of buyer's remorse as well for anyone who's holding their EOS shorts, if the uh, position's skyrocketing. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it, to return to uh, where mo how Monkey is feeling about the uh, last few weeks of the King of the Jungle portfolio challenge, round one, the answer is not very good, Badger. I'm not feeling good because, you know, you don't want to... Uh, <laughs> I don't like hanging my hat on, you know, a miracle of a short squeeze, even though it's possible. I, I'm sure we'll dissect the first year in a future episode more specifically, but it will take a little bit of a miraculous finale for me to win, even though it's looking unlikely. However, that said, in a segment I'd like to call Biotech Bravery, Betting Big and Bold on Coherence and Relay, we, as our listeners know, add 100 bucks to the portfolio at the beginning of the month. And I've tried so hard to restrain myself <laughs> from adding more uh, to the positions I already own, and I failed. <laughs> I failed. I failed miserably. And here's how I'd like to justify myself. Tell me if I'm wrong. But you're holding a significant chunk of cash in part because the companies you are buying are highly valued companies. So those val right. So the phenomenon we talked about early in the show exists very much for you. If there's a market correction, your companies will get whacked more significantly than mine. But my biggest company, Coheres, is so undervalued right now based on my due diligence that I put in a limit order for 99 cents, saying basically 99 cents is meaningless because price is uh, all relative. But at 99 cents, the market cap of Coheres is something like $110 million. I know that the one of its FDA approved drugs will probably have uh, annual revenue revenue of about 150 to 200 million dollars in 25, 26. So not too long, like as it commercially ramps. So I put in a limit order for 99 cents and it hit. So I added a bunch more coherent shares to my already large holding. And in part, this is the be greedy when others are fearful mantra. <laughs> now, you, you, you are, 
<laughs> rinsing and and giving me the stink eye. Uh, and, it's, and it's just we know what we're looking at, right? I'll I'll stick up the two pie charts of the diversification of our tool portfolios while we're chatting about this segment. Like you are now f- nearly fifty four percent of your entire King of the Jungle portfolio is Coherus, and like nearly forty percent is EOS, and then you have a bunch of other stuff. Whereas, look at my beautiful, like, looks like it's just come like dancing off of the Trivial Pursuit board with all of its beautifully equally spaced bits of pie. You know, I got a bunch of good quality stuff in there, all broadly uh, equal weighted. Well, to to your comment, maybe I just like anchovies and mushrooms on my pizza, you know, and I'm not going (laughs) to go go off buying every last thing. But But don't you know, you can't position this as investment advice, right? Would you, is there anyone listening to this podcast you would say this is the way to run a portfolio? Yeah, this is this is uh, way over way overweight in coherence. Okay, good. Uh, right. Then is uh, then is decent in a you know in a like a real world portfolio because anything could happen. But I did to balance it out. Also add to relay therapeutics. Same. Uh, that's a position I really want to make much larger. And the principle continues to be the numbers are getting better and better from the data readouts, the assets that they're working on in breast cancer and their breast cancer portfolio are just potential, absolute potential blockbusters. And the price, meanwhile, continues to stay at based on the future revenues of a blockbuster cancer drug, absolutely hugely undervalued. So I took all the remaining of my cash dollars and made Relay a bigger position. Unless a miracle happens in Coherence, which it probably won't, Badger, you're looking to to win the first round. We do have another bet in play, though, uh, the Axon versus EOS bet, and you do seem to be soundly kicking my ass on that one. Yeah, how's that make you feel? I'm cool. I've, I've got like 18 months left to run on that one. I'm still confident. I don't know, you want to double the stakes? You can keep your keep your starting prices if you like. Oh yeah, we should double, triple our the stakes. We, have, we didn't define these stakes. We should work out yeah. what the actual stakes are. <laughs> we, should, we should work out what the stakes are. <laughs> uh, but whatever they are, we should triple them. <laughs> For real. <laughs> I think I want to say one more thing uh, about adding coherence using a limit order. Hmm. This, this is. I would say the more professional way to do things where I made a deliberate calculation and I said, Coheris at this market cap is severely undervalued. That's it. That puts me uh, at an exact number. Not that it's an exact science, right? But I said, I want to buy more shares at 99 cents because that's a low market cap. And if the market happens to sway that way, then my order fills automatically. And so there's no, none of this feeling like that. I'm just, you know, say willy nilly gambling at something because I'm feeling hot or impulsive that day. So to me, this is a calculation on current value versus future value. I like the price. I put in the order, it hit on whatever day. And now I have something like, I believe, 850 coherence shares. So yeah. If it goes up for every 10 cents, it goes up. I'm making uh, $87. So <laughs> we, need to, yeah. we, need, we need to do like an episode on risk at some point. So you can, I can basically force you to acknowledge uh, the risk that you're carrying when you offer your portfolio in this way. Oh, I acknowledge it a hundred percent. And that is a future segment that, that I'm working on. Lots of stuff about risk in year two of Wall Street Wildlife. Great stuff. All right. So, Christoph, shall we uh, turn to our stock safari? And if you haven't caught the last couple of episodes, our listener, Tom, helped us name this segment. And so every week we're going on safari looking for two off the radar stocks. They're not necessarily investable. They're not necessarily great companies, but they are companies we've got an eye on and we're considering adding to our portfolios at some point. We've got two really interesting names for you this week. Christoph, you want to hit us up first? Who are you going on Safari with? Yes, I am calling this segment Level Up with Nintendo. The princess is in this castle. I am quite enthused about what I'm finding about Nintendo. 
this is one of those instances where depending on how the deep rest of the deep dive goes, this might end up being one of my next positions, both in the King of the Jungle portfolio and in my real world portfolio. Let me maybe start at um, start at the back, what I consider the back, why I'm in th- so enthused. I have a long history as an investor with what I call video games slash entertainment companies. In the first one, uh, I remember, my goodness, this was at the very start of my journey on The Motley Fool was with Marvel. And if you bought shares at that point, you made absolutely stunning amounts of money. Yeah, I was in that bandwagon too. My Marvel shares turned into Disney shares at some point. Yep. Yeah, so the entertainment business can be incredibly lucrative. But I was also a longtime shareholder of Activision. And the same sort of kind of thing happened that there was a, a, you know, Activision made video games and then they joined Blizzard and then it became a behemoth of a, of a company, even though there was a long period where the stock, what I remember thinking of, it was a spring coil, uh, coiled spring. <laughs> uh, Similarly, also an Activision shareholder, I guess it must have been reading the same newsletter and the stock went nowhere. I love the games, like massive fan of Starcraft, but, uh. Yeah, stock didn't do much in my portfolio. Right, for a long time until it did. So historically, I have this background in in video ga- in the video game industry. And by the way, I was also tick, uh, at the Motley Fool. I was the ticker advisor for Take Two, which is the company that makes Grand Theft Auto. Anyway, uh, one of my buddies is next door neighbors with the CEO of Take Two, as it turns out. Okay, <laughs> that's right. Uh, I forget you hang around castles uh, over the weekend <laughs> in your spare time. So <clears throat> here's the thing: Nintendo is a very, very interesting company. There's so much to say about it. It was it was uh, actually founded in uh, the nineteenth century, believe it or not. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that. No, I didn't it's know. yeah, it's historically one of the oldest companies there is. Um, but that's neither here nor there for this investment thesis. It was like a card. It was like a gaming company, card company kind of thing. Here's the thing, the pitch really, it can't be, it's not that Nintendo makes games that people like, because that would make it kind of the same as Activision and take two. What I'm seeing here is that Nintendo is starting to become the sort of Apple of video games. Let me explain. Apple sells the iPhone. They sell a lot of it, right? But it's now starting to get commodified. So especially at these levels of of performance. Apple's genius really is the way it locks people into its ecosystem, right? And that's kind of why you're not an Apple, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. That's why you don't particularly like the Apple phone because you like to think you're free. (laughs) I love Apple because I love its ecosystem. But once you're in, you're in. So here's an interesting thing. Gamers love the Nintendo Switch console, which is the little portable thing that you could take with you or you could put it into the handset and play it on your big TV. Pop quiz for you. How old is the Nintendo Switch console? Oh, crikey. Uh, I've never owned one. I'm going to guess like five, six years. Close. It's seven years old. Actually, I'm sorry. It's eight years old now. And here's the thing. People are still buying it like like crazy. So it's eight years old, which is, and, and still good is the point. So it hasn't become outdated because it's not really about the tech per se. The tech is already good enough. It's that people love Nintendo's, call it platform and world, that they continue buying the Switch. So the thesis is that Nintendo is now turning, call it, um, raison d'etre is people want in to the software system rather than needing a fancy new platform. That's half of it. But there is a new Switch that's going to be released in, I believe, March or April. So there will be a new influx of people upgrading. However, the word on the street is that this upgrade will be somewhat incremental and that most of it will stay the same. It'll just be slightly better frame rates and maybe a little glossier, this, that, or the other thing. But really, 
everything that Nintendo offers will remain the same and be playable. So it's not like going from zero to your users, then all of a sudden everybody needs to upgrade to the whole new system and start from zero again. So the whole point that I'm rambling on and on about is that most video games are cyclical. And you go, you you work up your user base, then it falls, then you have to work it up again. Nintendo is already has a proof in point that they have what it takes to create a self-sustaining, repeatable ecosystem that will just keep driving profits. There's a lot more to say about the economics of that. Not only that, last bit here, is that Nintendo also has a massive uh, intellectual property portfolio that they are starting to monetize. How? In 2023, Badger, worldwide box office, do you know what the top movie was in the world? Uh, 2023. Barbie, yep. maybe? Barbie. Yeah. yeah. One point, good guess, 1.4 uh, $1. billion. Dollars. I only know that because we went, I had to go on a Barbie themed 40th birthday <laughs> to uh, Barcelona. <laughs> I have my okay. <laughs> See, you know things. Second largest movie in the world, the Super Mario Brothers movie. Uh, not Oppenheimer. Okay, all right, cool. All yeah, right. Oppenheimer is three. Okay, all right. So, so that's the thing, right? Second largest movie in the entire world is Super Mario Brothers. That is a intellectual property character from 1986. Hmm. It's kind of staggering when you think about it. They're also opening up... Uh, theme parks. So they're basically taking the Disney, you know, playbook. So here's the thesis investment. I take my history with something like Disney and Pixar, right? We're seeing that in intellectual property. I take the playbook that Apple is using to develop an ecosystem that's not necessarily dependent on the hardware, locks users in. And as both of these work together synergistically, the users will go up the margins expand because it's not really about selling more mechanical things. It's about making people pay more once they're sort of at the theme park, whether in person or digitally. And all of a sudden you have a massive cash cow that is about to enter a new phase because of the upgrade to the switch, which hasn't happened for seven years. I'm incredibly excited about this, not least because it also has a strong balance sheet massive amounts of cash, uh, making the enterprise value uh, ratio to earnings pretty low, pretty appealing. That's great. It's definitely very different to really any of the other stocks that you own or you've talked about um, on the podcast. So good to see you jumping into, potentially jumping into something that might be almost considered like a, a solid investment. Oh yeah, this is, this is as well, uh, I, I, let me push back a little bit. I do have Tesla in my poor king of the jungle, even though it's a small position. However, that's also, you know, this company, Nintendo, I mean, this is like you're saying, this is a more of a badger kind of stock than it is the first year monkey stock. But uh, I'm absolutely loving what I'm seeing. And uh, if the market does in fact correct, then this would be one of, I would think, a safer places to put your money. Great stuff. Great stuff. Hey, I, I want to tell you about my Safari stock, but you just because you mentioned Tesla. So today is the 7th of the 10th, or the 10th, the 7th, the way you US guys say it. Uh, but on 1010, in three days time, there is the Tesla robo taxi event. Got any thoughts about that? Are you apprehensive as a shareholder? I freaking am. Uh, I'm not. I'm excited. I was, side note, I'm, I'm apprehensive about dark, dark MAGA Elon, uh, oh. but... <clears throat> I can't wait to see what they show. It's, it's uh, 3 a.m. my time, but I might set my alarm and get up and watch it live. It's a big thing. I will say, I will add a little comment, commentary here. It, it is one of these crossroad events for humanity, I think. As a leader in AI, actually, you know, buying, think of it this way. Tesla has bought more NVIDIA GPU chips than pretty much anyone, right? And now this is what they're saying they're going to do with all those chips. So there's people who that look at Tesla and say, this is an AI company on wheels, if you want to think of their cars that way. And the whole promise of autonomous driving has been what Musk himself has been saying is the reason for Tesla to 
for you to consider Tesla an investment, you have to believe that they will solve this problem. And this is their first update. And if it's successful in any way, then we're talking about a massive paradigm shift in the world, right? How driving happens. I, I, I sort of fear that we're not going to see enough from the event that's, that's substantial. Like they've rented, we haven't thought about or prepped this segment at all. I've just lured Christoph into it. But I think they've rented like Warner Brothers studio and they're, so I, I'm guessing that they've like mocked up like a town or something. Um, Cause I guess that's like film sets and they'll be doing like autonomous drives for journalists and stuff. But like, like Waymo are doing that for real right now in a bunch of cities. Right. So, and they'll, they'll have like a funky version of the car, maybe where all the seats face it forwards, there's no steering wheel, stuff like that. Sure, I think everyone expects that. Are they actually going to, at the end of the event, open the doors and the cars go rolling out and start like servicing uh, like neighboring districts? I don't think so. And uh, yeah, I, just, I, I agree with everything you said. I just think there's still going to be a long, hard road from here to get to true like level four autonomy. Elon has as we know, a long history of over-promising, under-delivering, who knows, right? But a lot is riding on this. And they have been putting out, like you said, a lot of publicity. So it's kind of odd if, you know, if you're not sure or if you have lots of doubt about this major inflection point, I don't think they'd be advertising it though, as aggressively as they seem to be. So well, they, they had a date and then they shifted it. But then like some senior, like board level, tech guy quit the firm left the firm like a few days ago just seems like odd timing you know if if you've done great work and elon's really happy with like your the progress of the technology stack you think you want to hang around and at least get some of the glory and be on stage i think what i'm sensing from this is i'm more optimistic than you you're you're reserving the right to be you know uh <laughs> to, you want to see the proof before you believe and i'm kind of as usual like more willing to believe that we'll see something good but yeah uh, well look i'm optimistic with my portfolio it's like a five percent position in my like net worth pretty much so yeah like i'm certainly hoping elon delivers or at least we see like glimmers of when the actual release date might be not like Elon dates, but real dates. Yeah, anyway, let's see. It's only three days to wait. Yeah. Okay. Well, so tangent. <laughs> yeah, good tangent though. Uh, maybe we can, we can talk about what we actually saw on next week's episode. But anyway, let me tell you about my Safari stock and why Anduril is a company that I'm trying to buy and they are a defense tech startup. And this is particularly difficult because it's a private company. You can't just go out and buy the shares. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to, if I'm honest. I'm all over a whole bunch of like private listing platforms. They're all US companies. I got a couple of private investments in the UK. Can you tell our listeners how one goes about gaining entry hmm. to, a, to, to a platform like that? Yeah. So like, okay, so let me tell you about Anduril and like its valuation. And then maybe we can come into that because the valuation actually tells us something about how you'd get access to the shares. They are a defense technology, military technology company. It's founded by a guy called Palmer Lucky. And if you're familiar with that name, it might be because he also invented the Oculus and then sold that to Facebook as it was before it became Meta. But he's now in military technology and he's a super smart guy. You think about the prime contractors. I own one of them in my portfolio, Lockheed Martin, but you've also got like Boeing and Raytheon and a bunch of others. Like, well, we talked at the top of the episode about America is broke. It's because like a ton of America's money is spent on military technology. And it's a bit of a legacy procurement process today where these prime contractors, essentially, um, they're selling stuff on cost plus, which means, you know, if, if it's going to cost Lockheed like $10 billion to develop like the next fighter aircraft then they'll sell that to the US government for $10 billion plus whatever the agreed profit margin is. Like that doesn't motivate companies like those guys to be efficient and optimize and cut costs where you've got like a really properly competitive market. So Palmer Lucky's company, Anduril, are trying to bring that startup competitive thinking, reusable components to 
the military space. And you might have seen some YouTubes of their technology. They've got a whole range of drones and UAVs and other cool bits of technology. But actually, they're primarily a software company. Their main product is something called Lattice, which is, I don't know, I couldn't tell you how it differs from Palantir, which is another company I own. But Lattice is like a software stack that integrates a whole bunch of different sensors and systems to give like the operators a comprehensive understanding of like a military, a battlefield situation. Now, uh, I got called out actually. I do like my monthly tweet thread now where I post my whole portfolio on X and LinkedIn and some other places. And I break down like recent transactions I've done. And I, I do position, I think about my portfolio as being like, I'm invested in companies that are making the world a better place. And some dude called me out like I saw it this morning when I woke up, he's like, oh, you're a clown. You say you're trying to make the world a better place, but you own Lockheed Martin. And like, I've got to own that, right? Um, I, in that same bucket is Palantir and is my hoped for acquisition of a tiny, tiny piece of Andrew Because if there ain't a world, right, there ain't a world to make a better place. And I'm, I've 180 on this in the last five or six years, I think, where I've come to realize that I don't know, it's because I'm like an older guy or something. I've just come to realize that it's not pragmatic to have your head up your ass a little bit, perhaps, and say, oh, you know, military technology is bad. Like, you got to protect your way of life. Um, and sometimes you got to, if you're a big behemoth like the US, you got to get out there and protect uh, other like-minded cultures and their ways of life, a bit like what's happening in Ukraine right now and in the Middle East. So anyway... Long story short, like military technology, I think is a essential. And if you like, just take all the emotions out and everything else, like this is a growth in industry, right? Hard to argue that like military tech companies are not going to be doing very well. So, you know, underpinning all of this is also my thought that, hey, this is going to be like a growth sector. I want to be invested in it. So getting invested in it. How do you buy shares of let's say Anduril specifically. So they're not public, which means you can't go and download like a quarterly or an annual report. You've got really no insight into the company at all, other than what you can glean from like catching interviews with members of the leadership team and maybe looking at press releases and other articles from that space. So it's actually quite hard to get a clear sense of really anything about the company. When you go public, suddenly you have all of these requirements to be super transparent and publish like all of your books and everything at least on an annual basis and a quarterly basis you give like updates but right now you, you've got none of that information if you want to invest in a company like Andrew or SpaceX or Stripe or any of the other big famous private companies and tiny little ones too. Um, Andrew did their last round they did a series F so I don't know if you know how this stuff works like when you start off you're like a maybe have like a friends and family round when you're like literally like a, you know, million dollar company. And then you might do like a seed round where you raise like a bit more money, typically up to maybe $5 million, something like that, 10 million bucks. And then series A, series B, C, D, E, F. So Andrew are up to series F. And in their series F, which was quite recent, June, 2024, they raised just over a billion US dollars at a post money valuation of $14 billion. So you can buy shares on the private market, the secondary market. And like, if you're a massive venture capital firm, then you can just, you can buy directly in that round. Like there were funds like Founders Fund getting involved and they, were, they took a piece of the Series F because they're negotiating directly with the company and now they own like a chunk of that billion dollars of new stock that was issued. But if you're some tiny little dude like me, who's got nothing like a billion dollars to invest, they're not going to give you the time of day. They're not interested in talking to you. But there are shares available because you've got, say, employees who have vested their stock options and they want to sell them. And also sometimes some of these funds maybe break it down and they'll sell their piece and they'll create what's called special purpose vehicles, SPVs. So it's almost like companies within companies within companies and if some of these big, bigger shareholders want to sell their, sell pieces of their allocation, they can do that through an SPV. 
So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get a piece of an SPV that's invested in Anduril. And there's no liquidity. Like I've put bids in on a couple of them. Like right now, you just got to pay through the nose. Those guys got in a $14 billion valuation a couple of months ago. But if I just look at where it's trading right now, it's probably closer to $30 billion. And Wait, how, how do you know where it's trading at if it's private? Because uh, some of these secondary markets publish like the last transaction that was successful where a buyer and a seller, like it's not like a stock market where you buy at the bid price and sell at the offer price and you don't know who your counterparty is. If you're buying in the secondary market, like there's a contract, you have to get lawyers involved potentially, depending on how mature this the company you're buying from is. Essentially, you're buying like shares of a company and that company exists to own shares of the target company, Anduril in this case. And so when some of these secondary market sellers are buy, have, well, they've like, there's been like a buyer and a seller have found each other. So most recently, the mo like, most recent private market trade was at $35, which was a couple of days ago. So that puts the market cap at about $30 billion. So like you can't use any of your investing skill set really for this sort of stuff because who knows if $30 billion is a fair price to pay for Anduril. All I know with certainty is some very smart people thought that $14 billion was a fair price like back in June. Th that has a bunch of warning bells mm. coming up for me, but there's guy, I, I feel incredulous to think that if you're a serious investor with a lot of money, that there is no equivalent of something like a, uh, you know, annual report or latest earnings or anything like that. You're making it sound like it's just, yeah, like hearsay or trust based. That can't, that can't be right. No, but it's not publicly available. So if you are an investor, right, you will get investor materials. But typically, like I'm like a bunch of the companies I have a small private stake in, I'll get an email every quarter with like a, a, a business update. It won't be formalized. You know, it comes from the company itself, it's not like been through anything like the Securities Exchange Commission. It could be arbitrary format. One of the companies literally just sends like an email with a couple of pretty pictures. Another one right. just sends like a few bullet points. Um, you are, there is a lot of trust involved. You know, you are taking the company at its word because that, that information isn't always audited. So yeah, so that, that there is trust involved. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this, so I would put this in the obviously beyond, uh, expert graduate level of investing. You don't want to come anywhere near this stuff, uh, unless you happen to have some inside information of, of the legal kind, or you're properly connected to someone or, you know, like this. Yeah. Uh, but may I comment, offer one comment about the sort of big holistic picture in this, mm -hmm. as you were to describing, you know, work investing into the military industrial complex, it is another one of those things where you said yourself, there's our idealism, and then there's the reality on the ground. And then in the end, everybody still has to make their own ethical choices. Yep. Uh, for me, I don't think I could ever invest in a company like this, even if I upgrade my mind software to we need companies like this. It, you know, yeah. So it's an open question everyone needs to wrestle with. Not every company is, no matter how promising, you, you could sleep at night owning. I don't think I could. Yeah. So yeah, no, I, I, I totally get that. Uh, it's not for everybody. Just like, like a bunch of people make good money investing in tobacco companies like that's not for me but the world is getting yeah i mean it's i mean yeah let's not spend no use in me speculating and spinning off on on moral theory right now but um as a potential investor i would be damn sure that uh or as sure as i could be that this is not exacerbating the world into a much darker place faster than it would otherwise get to on its own yeah i think it's i think like bad things happen whether you want them to or not and I'd rather be part of a coalition of countries that had the best technology. Like I'm just playing uh, Age of Wonders 4 because I'm always playing some like game in the background on PC, like here and there. And I just started playing it a few days ago, so I spent like way too much time staring at the damn thing. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a bit like, like Civilization, Civ Six, kind of like that. Yeah. There's like lots of ways of being victorious, like a military victory where you just kind of like beat everyone into submission. There's like a 
culture victory where you win them over with your like your art or a religious victory where you kind of convert everybody. I'm, I always find myself going for like the science victory, right? Because you can out science people. And in Civ Six, that's like you you win by like uh, oh. launching like shit and like, you know, putting satellites up and doing stuff like that. And in, I like uh, that. Uh, yeah. Oh. So I'm like, a, I'm like, even if you look like you're losing, if you're winning at the science and innovation, like you'll suddenly come out of nowhere and your, your, uh, your competitors will be like, Holy F, like, where did you pull that victory from, Luke? So, yeah, I, th I feel like companies like Palantir and Anduril, they're arguably, you know, they're chasing the military victory, um, but they're really like science companies. And uh, I'm glad it's the West that, that has these companies in its portfolio. I'd be remiss not to point out that as a professor of literature, there is a book called Frankenstein. Hmm by Mary Shelley, which the romantics thought, you know, uh, they thought some, some deep thoughts about the dangers of thinking that man could control nature and via his highfalutin reason mess with the natural order. And if you've read that book, which I, uh, you know, you're a Brit, it's by your people. <laughs> I'm familiar with the story. Yeah, well, read the book. It's it's it, you know it's a tale as old as time. But I, uh, that distinction between the military complex as one form of victory and science, you know, there's science has its own uh, troubles. Well, as we will see as soon as Elon's got actually got his robo taxis on the streets, right? There will be deaths, uh, but it's in the name of progress. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Well, that that was a lot of yapping for a Monday morning. <laughs> It certainly was. We we hope our our current patrons uh, are enjoying the yapping. Maybe our future patrons uh, will say, "Yeah, we give us even more." Did we uh, like we we prioritized a question from Deb last week or two weeks ago, and we spent a whole half an episode on it. And I've seen she is now a Patreon, so I assume that's the same Deborah. So thank you, Deborah, for jumping on board. Did we get any questions that we should field next week from our current patrons? Yeah, I want to address, uh, Bruce uh, wanted us to talk about a little bit uh, trading, some trading mentality and stops, mm -hmm. stop and stop losses, which I could I'd be very happy to handle. So that might be next week. Awesome. Great stuff. If you are a, a Patreon or if you're not, like you can still find us on Twitter, on X, and like hit us up with any questions, queries, challenge our opinions, tell me why I'm an idiot for trying to buy this private company when I've got no idea what it's really doing. Tell Christoph that he's doomed with Nintendo. He should stick to EOS and Coherus. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe uh, uh, let us know as the king of the jungle portfolio round one is uh, on the final straightaway, who you're pulling for and what you thought about what turned out to be very unique individual strategies, whether Badger just got lucky with his tried and true invest in world-class companies, whether Monkey just, you know, uh, happened to eat a rotten banana or whether this was, you know, scripted from day one to, to be the outcome that, that it is. We'd love to hear you. Uh, check us out on uh, all the platforms, YouTube and all of that. Just to plug them specifically, we're on patreon.com slash wall street wildlife you can find christoph and i on x that's where we most like to chat i'm at seven luke hallard and i am at seven flying platypus and actually side note to that i'm the one mostly running the patreon account a little peek behind the curtain so comments work extremely well there so that that or youtube are a great way for us to engage do find us on YouTube if you're only listening on the uh, the pod. There are occasionally visuals. I'll jump a bunch of these charts and graphs into today's video edit. And uh, even if you don't watch on YouTube, just like click over there and subscribe because it's good for the algorithm and it helps us. All right. Are All right. you ready to be a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. <laughs> A reminder.
reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.